morning, everyone. Our scripture reading today comes from John chapter 17, verses 1 through 23. When Jesus finished saying these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son can glorify you. You gave him authority over everyone so that he could give eternal life to everyone you gave him. This is eternal life, to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent. I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I shared with you before the world was created. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from this world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. This is because I gave them the words that you gave me, and they received them. They truly understand, understood that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you gave me, because they are yours. Everything that is mine is yours, and everything that is yours is mine. I have been glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, even as I'm coming to you. Holy Father, watch over them in your name, the name you gave me, that they will be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I watched over them in your name, and the name you gave to me, and I kept them safe. None of them were lost except for the one who is destined for destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now I'm coming to you, and I say these things while I'm in the world, so that they can share completely in my joy. I gave your word to them, and the world hated them, because they don't belong to this world, just as I don't belong to this world. I'm not asking that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to this world, just as I don't belong to this world. Make them holy in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. I made myself holy on their behalf so that they also would be made holy in the truth. I'm not praying for them only, but also for those who believe in me because of their word. I pray they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me so that they can be one just as we are one. I'm in them and you are in me so that they will be made perfectly one. Then the world will know that you sent me and that you have loved them just as you loved me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jason. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for this day as we gather for worship this morning. We know that we gather in worship with people around the world who are in different kinds of churches, different sorts of settings from villages in Africa where they may be meeting under a tree to, to large churches, mega churches, to cathedrals, to, to small country churches in the middle of nowhere. Lord, we're so grateful that your word brings us together. And so as we hear it this morning, may it unify us in the name of Christ. Well, we are now officially halfway through the Lenten season. We're on the fourth Sunday of Lent, and so we're moving rapidly toward uh, Holy Week and Easter. And every Lent, I try to pick up a new devotional practice. Um, This year, uh, the thing that I gave up for Lent was social media, which has been uh, better than any food I could possibly have given up. Um, I feel lighter. I feel less conflicted. When people say, did you read what so-and-so said? I say, no, I don't know what they wrote, and I don't care that much. It doesn't really affect my life. It allows more time for for other things, and and so that's been a blessing. But the other practice that I've picked up, because when you give up something, you should also pick up something new, a spiritual practice to replace it, was uh, using the Book of Common Prayer. This is the 1662 edition of the Book of Common Prayer. This is the same uh, Book of Common Prayer 
that John Wesley would have used in his day. And um, this is not an original 1662 version. This is a, a newly published uh, Cambridge edition of the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. I splurged on it. It has gilded edges, and it's made of rich Moroccan leather, which I just love the smell. Do you have a Bible smell? Anyone? Anyone? You're still dealing with spring break. I know you're still a little bit hungover for spring break, but but I'm telling you, Bible smell is the best. And, and you get that when you use the Book of Common Prayer. And one of the other things that happens is that praying this particular Book of Common Prayer puts you in a different language almost because you're in Old English, in King James English. And you're using words that, that we don't really use in our language anymore, like vouchsafe or hopen or words that you had to look up to kind of figure out what they mean. But it's powerful to be able to do that. The, more, the Book of Common Prayer is structured around morning and evening prayers. So each morning and each evening, you pray prayers from the book. And they also have Old Testament and New Testament readings, morning and evening. And if you use those readings, you'll read through most of the Bible over a two-year period. You also read several psalms each morning and each evening. You use those as part of your prayer. And at the end of the month you will pray all 150 psalms. So you go through all the psalms every month. And so there's a rich discipline around this and some ancient prayers in here. And you're praying the same prayers each day, each morning, and each evening. You start with a prayer of confession. And I love the King James English around that, that, that Lord, we are miserable sinners. We don't say that enough. And, uh, and uh, that's a great way to start the morning. You know, you're, you're, let's begin the day by saying that you're miserable. And, uh, but it's also a, a, a wake-up call, right? That we are, we are in need of this grace. We are in need of what Christ has to offer us. And so this has been a marvelous discipline for me. Some people would say, though, that isn't it boring reading the same prayers every day? I mean, praying them over and over again, doesn't that get old? It becomes rote. It almost becomes like a habit. And my response to that is, exactly. It becomes a habit. And the more that you pray these prayers, the more that they begin to pray you. The more that you have them on your heart, the more they pop to mind throughout the day, especially when you're dealing with temptation or in a particular situation. There's a, there's a power in worshiping and praying with people over a long period of time. And so people have used this prayer book for centuries now. And it's an opportunity for me to recognize that when I pray, I'm not praying in isolation. I'm praying with Christians not only that are around today, but also that have been around for centuries before me. And indeed, I think the Bible provides us with prayers like this for that very reason. The Bible itself has its own prayer book, the Psalms, which you read as part of the Book of Common Prayer. Jesus used the Psalms as his prayer book. And in fact, you see him quoting the Psalms often. The Psalms are quoted over and over again in the New Testament because they were the prayer book that people called to mind there in the first century. We remember Jesus at prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, for example, a famous prayer where he prays so fervently, Lord, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours. And he prayed so fervently that he sweated as if drops of blood. We see Jesus going off to pray by himself often throughout the Gospels, which is a reminder that that he has this intimate life with the Father, and it's this intimate life that he invites us into. John makes that very clear to us as we read through his gospel. But I think this prayer that we read in John chapter 17 is one of those prayers that was designed for us to pray through often as the people of God. I think that's why John captures it. That's why he places it here at the end of the farewell discourse, which we talked a little bit about last week. It's an example of prayer for a community facing a hostile world. It's a prayer for the church to live up to. And as a result, it provides the shape of hope and truth and unity for the church. So I want to dive into this in some detail this morning. If you have your Bibles there, if you don't have them, they're in the seats in front of you. It's going to be important for you to kind of follow along this morning so that you can uh, follow the different verses and how this prayer kind of unfolds. Uh, John chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. You notice how the prayer begins. It says, Jesus looked up to heaven. Now, when we think of prayer, we think of doing exactly the opposite. We bow our heads, we fold our hands, we close our eyes, 
And I don't know about you, but for me, that is an instant invitation to be thinking and doing anything but prayer, right? You kind of get into that sense of inward self, and you, your mind starts to wander, and all those kinds of things happen. At least to me, I'm very distracted when I do that. But the early church did not pray that way. In fact, they rarely prayed silently, and they never prayed uh, sitting down or, or looking down. It was always looking up. It was an expression of openness to, to God. And, and I love that imagery. When you use the Book of Common Prayer, for example, it, it invites you into different postures as you pray. There are several times throughout the morning where you are to kneel when you pray. And somehow kneeling, we have the kneeling benches here, is a different posture that brings us closer. Our bodies get involved in our prayer. And so Jesus demonstrates this posture, and he lifts this prayer to God. And it's a prayer for his disciples, and by extension, a prayer for us. Jesus' hour has come. We've been talking about that through John's gospel. This hour has come for him to be glorified on the cross. Now, there's no prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in John as there is in the Synoptic Gospels. This prayer of Jesus happens before they head out to the Garden. And so the focus here is not on Jesus' agony over the cross. That will come later. But rather, the focus of this prayer is on the legacy and mission that Jesus is leaving for his disciples in light of the cross, in light of his coming resurrection and ascension. Verse 4, Jesus seems to already assume that his earthly mission is finished. And what's his last word from the cross that we'll read here on Good Friday? It is finished, the work that he came to do. He assumes now that it's already finished. He will reiterate that. But the point is that his mission was to bring eternal life. That's consistent through the crucial uh, parts of John. That theme runs all the way through. Jesus acknowledges that the Father gave him, verse 3, authority over everyone so that he could give eternal life to everyone. That's the mission. Eternal life is the result of, verse 4, knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That takes us back to chapter 14, verse 6, which we talked about last week. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus now says that they will know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's the key. That's the way to eternal life. And so Jesus reinforces this way to the Father in this prayer, that eternal life comes through him. He's now about to return to the Father, and he asks that his glory be made known. A glory, he says in verse 5, that he has shared with the Father, since the beginning of creation. Where does that take us? Back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was was God. He was in the beginning with God. He was there at creation. And so John wants us to be reminded again that the one who created the world is the very one who will go to the cross in order to redeem it. In verse 6 then, Jesus shifts from praying for himself to praying for his disciples. Verse 6, he has revealed God's name to the people God gave him from the world. Now, how has Jesus revealed God's name? Here again, remember back to Exodus. Remember, John is writing to a Jewish audience. They would have recognized this right away. When Moses asked God what his name is, who should I say is sending me? What does God say his name is? I am who I am. And we have seen throughout John's gospel, Jesus using these I am statements. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. A reinforcement over and over again that that this is God in the flesh. And those who have followed Jesus, verse 7, now know God and everything God has done and given. Remember Philip's question last week? Show us the Father and that will be enough. And Jesus says, I have shown you through what I've done. If you know me, you know the Father. And so in verse 8, Jesus reminds them they've received his words, they've understood that he came from God, and believed that God had sent him. Now here's a curious thing. When I was studying this, it jumped out at me that Jesus is praying here 
before going to the garden, before his arrest, before his crucifixion, and all of that, even before his disciples will deny him and run away, he prays as if they understand everything that's been happening. He says they, they've understood, when clearly at this point in the narrative, they have not. They have no idea what's about to happen. I would expect Jesus to pray something more like, Father, the men that you gave me are morons. Uh, they don't know Jack. Uh, so I pray that somehow when we're done here, they will get it. I mean, wouldn't you pray that? I mean, <laughs> that seems logical given what's going on here. But Jesus doesn't pray this way. He prays as if their belief and faithfulness is already a fact. A state into which they will grow after the resurrection. He prays them into faithfulness. He assumes the best for them. He sets the bar high and assumes that they're going to reach it. I think this is instructive on how we too should pray. We should pray for ourselves and others that that we pray into faithfulness. We assume that God is already at work. It's an aspirational kind of prayer. It reminds me of what, what the Moravian Peter Bowler said to John Wesley when he was struggling in his faith. He said, John, preach faith till you have it, and then because you have it, you'll preach faith. There's something about that. Aspirational prayer. And we know that the disciples will live up to this prayer with God's help. And Jesus prays that we will live up to it as well. Jesus prays for his disciples then and their relationship with the world. Now remember that the world in John's literature, and I'm talking about the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, means the world of sin, the world that is opposed to God's purposes. Jesus says the disciples are not from the world, but they are still in the world. Because they are in Christ, and Christ is not from the world, they are not from the world, but yet they still live in the world. Remember last week we talked about the Father's house, that place and presence, that indwelling presence of Christ. Wherever He is, we are as well. And so Christ is in the world, the Holy Spirit is in the world, the disciples are in the world, but they are not from this world. They're not to take on the qualities of this world. Those who are in Christ share his way, his truth, and his life, not the values of the world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, John describes the values of the world. See if these make sense to you. The values are whatever the body feels, the craving for whatever the eyes see, and the arrogant pride in one's possessions. Money, sex, and power. Those are the ways of the world. Jason and I were talking this morning. He and his family went to Vegas on spring break. Uh, if you want to see the values of the world writ large, that's the place to do it. I've never been, but based on his description, I ain't ever going. Right? It's one of those things. Some people like it, but uh, you know, you always have to kind of keep your guard up in the midst of that because our world's values are always around us. Those who are in Christ will always be at odds with the values of the world, even while they are still living in the world. And so Jesus prays that the Father would watch over his disciples while they live his way in the world, because the pull of the world is still very strong. Verse 12, Jesus says that he had watched over the disciples while with them, and that only one of them was lost to the lure of the world. And of course, that was Judas. Judas who betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And John really gives us kind of a window into Judas, that he was pretty greedy. Early on, he talks about Judas being the one who kept the money bag and used to help himself to what was in there. So it's not out of character for him to be lured by one of those attractions of the world, by money, to betray Jesus. But Jesus doesn't ask his father to take his disciples out of the world. He does ask, though, that they be kept safe, verse 15, from the evil one. They don't belong to the world, but as Jesus was sent into the world, so they will be sent into the world to bring the good news of eternal life. Jesus 
is the disciples model. He is holy on their behalf, verse 19, so that they might be made holy in the truth. He has shown them how this is to be. As he has done, they are to do. Holy here does not mean separated from the world, but rather separated from its values. Jesus was in the world, but not driven by its values. Neither should his disciples be either. Jesus has indicated over and over again that his disciples are going to be at odds with the world. Verse 14, the world will hate them because they don't belong to the world. It's so often that we talk about relevance in the church. You know, we've got to be relevant to the world. We've got to kind of adapt our styles. And, and many churches have tried to do this. You know, they've taken out the crosses and they've, they've taken out a lot of other things. And, and I get it. I mean, it's, it's a way of kind of trying to connect with people who are seekers. But, but the more you adopt the world's values, the less important the church becomes. The less important, the less distinct the community becomes. It's no longer the community of Christ. It's the community of what's happening now. I mean, I mean, why would you get up on, on Sunday morning and, and come to church in the cold and the fog and, and whatever? Why would you come here if all you're going to hear is the same kind of junk you can get from Oprah? Right? Amen? Okay, all right, I'm checking to see if you're with me here. Maybe you were watching Oprah before you came. I don't know. I mean, she does some, she does some good stuff, but come on. I mean, you know. What are we doing? Holy does not mean separated. It means that we're not driven by the world's values. Jesus doesn't pray that his disciples will hunker in the bunker. He prays that new generations of disciples will boldly go into the world with the truth. A unified community of Christ followers will demonstrate an alternative to the values of the world. They will demonstrate the way, truth, and life of Jesus. This is why the early church was so attractive in the Roman world, because it looked completely different than the way people normally lived. They weren't trying to be relevant. They were trying to be faithful. They were trying to be holy. And the world looked at them and said, they've got something different. Because the way the world works isn't working. We need something else. Look at verse 20. Jesus says, I pray that they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they will also be one in us so that, so that the world will believe that you sent me. Now, many subsequent generations of disciples have turned to Jesus' prayer as the ground for unity among believers. But don't miss the fact that for Jesus, unity is a reflection of the truth. It's never simply unity for unity's sake. It's not just a join hands and sing kumbaya around the campfire. It's unity, a spiritual unity around the truth. It's unity for the sake of a consistent witness to the world about the revelation of God through Jesus, as he says in verse 21. 1 John reveals that John's community had undergone schism over the question of who Jesus is. There were some in that community who had denied that Jesus was the Christ, and John calls them antichrists. That's a pretty, pretty heavy indictment when you think about it. But it's a vital question. Because if there's no truth, if there's no agreement on truth, if there's no connection to the truth, no connection to who Christ is, what the mission is, what it's all about, what the gospel is, then unity becomes almost impossible. Unity and truth must always be held in balance. And history proves that that's very difficult for Christians over time. We're still trying to live up to Jesus' prayer. Protestants, for example, tend to value truth over unity. And because we all have our own version of the truth, we tend to subdivide all the time. Whereas on the other hand, the great magisterium, the great traditions of Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy tend to emphasize unity, sometimes at the expense of truth. It's a very delicate balance. But what Jesus is talking about here is a spiritual unity, a unity with the Father, Son, and Spirit, and the resulting unity of the core of the gospel. It's the unity that Jesus prays for at the beginning of the prayer, a unity in knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is the unity that holds Christians together no matter the denomination. You know, 
a lot of people read this text and say, isn't it terrible that we have so many denominations? I'm not sure that's the point here. In fact, I think there's a richness to the diversity of the body of Christ, that we do things a little bit differently in different places. I mean, Paul talks about the body of Christ, one body, many members. I think you could almost look at that in, in the same way. The question is, do we hold together the same truth in the middle? You know, like there, there are different practices that churches do that, that I probably couldn't, couldn't be part of. Like there's a reason I'm not a Baptist, you know, but I love my Baptist brothers and sisters. And, and I believe that they are as Christian as I am. They just do things a little differently. They look at me and say, you do things a little differently. You, you, you sprinkle, we dunk. I mean, you know, there, there's that. Uh, you know, there are others who, you know, like, you know, I grew up Presbyterian, um, you know, PCA Presbyterian, where we memorized the Westminster Shorter Catechism, Shiite Presbyterian. I mean, it was, it was intense, you know, and so it's different. I, I don't think I could go back there, but I, I value that upbringing so much. And, I, and I'm thankful for it every day. I, I love the fact that uh, one Thursday, the third Thursday of every month, I gather with other pastors from different churches in the Monument area. We meet over at Wesley Owens at 0700. And the main reason for us to gather together is to check in with one another and pray for one another. Because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ask how we can pray for one another and we, we get together and do some things together when we can. And, and it, it's a powerful witness, I think, to, to our community that even though we have different traditions, we're still united in Christ. We're united in the truth. But when that truth fractures, unity tends to fracture as well. John's community was rent by schism. In 1 John, we learn that some had denied Jesus was the Christ. They had gone off on their own. And every generation of Christians faces a similar challenge. We've got to discern what it means to preach and live the truth, the way, truth, and life of Jesus. Because the pull of the world is strong. The pull is strong to go in different directions. The pull toward relevance is strong because you've got to put uh, uh, butts in the seats and you've got to, you've got to do the budget, and you got to do all that kind of stuff. And sometimes that means that, that you maybe have to cut a few corners in order to, to fill the place up, right? You, you might need to do that because, as Jesus says, the truth isn't often popular. Sometimes it hurts. We're seeing that in United Methodism. And I haven't talked a whole lot about that because it's a, it's a whole thing. But if you know anything about what happened at our general conference, you know that that was not a stellar display of unity in any way, shape, or form. And that's because unity can't be secured through voting. Amen? I mean, democracy is the worst sort of government, except for all the others, right? There's, there's, <laughs> there are always winners and losers when there's a vote, particularly when the vote is split. And when you, if you're in a meeting and you have a 51-49 vote, you know you're going to have a problem. And that's essentially where we are. We've got a problem because we've got different visions of the truth. Does that mean that one side or the other isn't Christian? No. It means that our disagreement is sharp. It may be sharp enough that we have to separate as Paul and Barnabas separated for the sake of their witness. Because the world doesn't want to see us battling one another. It wants to see us doing the things, making community in the way of Christ. Sometimes we have different ways of doing that that are not compatible, and yet we can still call one another brother and sister in Christ. Maybe that's where we are. Voting is not the way. Discernment is what we need. And I'm pleased to tell you, I think that now, after General Conference, people on all sides of issues are looking at that and saying, we don't want to do that again. That is a bad look for us in the world. We want to discern a way forward that allows everyone to live with integrity and to remain connected in some way as the body of Christ. I think there's hope in that. And that's what I'm praying for in the midst of all this. Jesus prays that his disciples then and now will be made perfectly one, unified spiritually in the truth. Then the world will know that you sent me, verse 23, and that you have loved them just as you have loved me. The church is at its best when it's unified in truth even if diverse in practice. The goal is for all of us to be where Jesus is, to abide with him and to see his glory.
he says in verse 24. That's what it's about. I love this book of common prayer. Every time I open it, I feel like I'm participating in something much greater than myself. I can hear others echoing those words. When I was in Oxford this summer, I went to, to morning prayer every morning in Christ Church Cathedral, and we used the very same words and said them over and over again. And in the evening, there was even song where, where they sang the psalms, which was beautiful, right, with a choir and so forth. It's not really my kind of music, as you might guess, but, but in that setting, it was marvelous. It was angelic. I love praying these prayers, even though they're a little bit odd at times. You know that because this is the Church of England prayer book, twice a day, you pray for the queen. Twice a day. Imagine if we prayed for the president and Congress twice a day, that and I mean really prayed, aspirational prayers, aspirational prayers, right? But, but there's something to think about. I mean, you can't tell me that the queen is in her 90s and still going strong. Does praying for her twice a day, everybody have something to do with that? I don't know. Maybe so. But there's something about connecting within a tradition over time and praying in concert with other Christians across denominations, across time and space. I, I um, discovered this. Um, the publisher that published my book, um, Seedbed Publishing, has published a little guide. It's called A Field Guide to Daily Prayer. And this little field guide is kind of the, the book of common prayer in miniature. It offers prayers for morning and evening. It offers a, a way to read the, through the Psalms in a month and, and all of that. And uh, we've got some copies of this out there. If you want to pick one up, I think they're $3. Um, you can grab one of these. And if, you, if we run out, we'll, we'll order more because I think it's really marvelous when people are praying together, even though they may be in separate places over time. So, so uh, check that out. And uh, maybe it's a new opportunity for you to invest in this kind of prayer. The prayer of Jesus is that we be united in truth. And the more we pray together, the more united we become. We become united in Christ so that the world may come to know him and the abundant life that he brings. May our prayers, our love for one another, our unified commitment to the truth, make it clear that we are a people who know Christ and make him known. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this marvelous prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the opportunity to read your word and gather together in community. Help us, Lord, to reflect your unity and your glory in all that we do. And with the church over time, we pray this prayer of St. John Chrysostom from the Book of Common Prayer. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desire and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting.